UX Podcast is funded by James and Pat, together with contributions we get from you, our listeners. If you'd like to contribute, you can do so financially, but also as a volunteer. We'd love your help to make sure we get our transcripts and various other things created and published for each show. Raise your hand to help by emailing uxpodcast at uxpodcast.com. UX Podcast, episode 246. I'm James. I'm Pad. And this is UX Podcast, balancing business, technology, and people every other Friday since 2011. We've listeners in 195 countries from around the world, from Belgium to Burkina Faso. Or maybe we can say, Bienvenue sur UX Podcast, Burkina Faso. Ooh, nice. A little bit of French. Uh, Burkina Faso is actually just northeast of uh, the country I was born in, which is Liberia. Uh, it doesn't border, but it's very close. So welcome. This week, this time, we've got a link show for you. And that's when we find two articles, one article each, uh, during our digital travels, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, try and discuss those uh, present them to each other and discuss them and see uh, if we can agree or not with the content. And today for, for you, we have uh, first out is The Brief Guide to Testing Mobile Interfaces by Andrew Yevtushenko and Marina Yolanska. And second up, we've got Delivering a Good Experience, uh, Delivering a Good Experience as a Developer by Pierre Mouchon. Lots of French today. Yeah, nice. <laughs> I didn't know you had that skill, James. I, I think I lost it years ago. It got eaten up by French, uh, by Swedish. <laughs> uh, as you might expect, we're actually getting uh, a tad technical today, I, I believe. Uh, and I think that's one thing that you and I have in common that maybe not all listeners are aware of, that we actually have quite technical backgrounds in that we have dabbled with programming and we've had computers really early on so we we really enjoy the technical aspects of the web but i don't want you to scare them off mm -hmm. Pat, though because what what we're hoping to do i think with our discussions that we haven't had yet um today is connect the the design world and the developer world a little better and exactly understanding how we can do a better job by understanding uh new perspectives so the first article is is one I found, and I, it, it ap appealed to me a lot because it introduced actually uh, a ton of vocabulary that I, these are words I hear often in projects, but I'm always not always specific as to what they mean. It, it, I, sometimes they float by, and I realize, okay, we have to do some type of testing, and there's different types of testing mentioned, and I'm not actually aware always of what those entail. So... In the project I'm currently working on, where we're testing different um, versions of a mobile interface by testing it in different types of phones, and I realized that I could be a, of better help to the developers by being better at explaining what I mean within the context of their world. So this, this article uh, starts out by discussing why we're testing. <laughs> which, of course, is a good start. Uh, we're talking about product quality. We're talking about we want to reveal, reveal bugs. And that's why we test interfaces. And the article itself is around testing mobile interfaces. But for me, it actually, testing any software and actually testing any website as well, this is relevant. This article article is really relevant. I can tell you that, but it mm -hmm. was actually quite... Um, my, well, my instant reflection when I read it was, mm -hmm. whoa, man, this is complicated. I know, I know, exactly, and I think I was in the right mindset to actually for it to be appealing to me all of a sudden, and, and as I was reading it, as you were saying, wow, this is hugely useful to me. It's just because it just introduces this installation testing, functional testing, performance testing, and has a sentence or two just describing what those different testing types are. Do, uh, do which, you want me to? Me. Do you want me to read out the? Ver I mean, because I think it's actually a wonderful um, list of these different um, yeah, aspects. I mean, it. Mm talks about um, testing in relation to native apps, web apps, 
hybrid apps. And then it goes on to talk about how you would do unit testing, integration testing, system testing, acceptance testing. But then on top of that, you have um, usability testing, installation testing, functional testing, performance testing, interruption mm -hmm. testing, memory testing, security mm -hmm. testing. They, it's, it's a lot of different things to, to test. Right. Uh, and uh, as I was reading it, I was, I was realizing that this is so much more structured than any usability test um, that I've been part of. Uh, when you said unit testing, that's actually testing a small part of the interface that's, that, that isn't integrated with anything else. So let's say we're testing a button or we're testing just one page of a website. Whereas when you go on, you go integration testing. So this form interacts with this other next step in the form. So you're integrating different pieces of the puzzle. So you have to figure out, do those function well together? And then you go on to test the whole system, which would be the whole website or the whole app. Uh, and acceptance testing is, of course, when the client steps in to approve, does this work the way we expect it to? So those are the different levels, going from the smallest tiny piece of unit that you want to test. I mean, from a UX perspective, that would be, does the button look the way I want it to? And then you look at, do the buttons across the different pages look the way I want them to? Uh, do they make sense? Do we have primary, secondary thoughts about what they should look like? But, uh, but also not just visually, Per. I mean, mm -hmm. the button has to be clickable and it has to actually yeah. do a function. Yep. I wanted to keep it simple, but you're right. It's, <laughs> it's always more complex than I mentioned. <laughs> of course. Uh, and then there's, uh, when you were going on to describe the different types then, I realized that those different types of testing also help me to understand the different scenarios that we perhaps tend to forget <laughs> when we're doing usability testing. Because I loved the way you talked about interruption testing. So when you're on a phone and you're browsing, sometimes you will get a call. Sometimes the phone will run out of memory. The battery will, will go low. Uh, the media player will start playing or will turn off or something like that. And you have to push a button to, to push it aside. And, and these are scenarios that can happen as you're using it. I'm gonna to add to that one as well though, of course, mm -hmm. is, is mm -hmm. loss of network. Which is something, yes. I mean, I've been part of many tests where mm -hmm. one of the tests is you pull mm -hmm. out the network cable back in the day mm -hmm. when we weren't using Wi-Fi or you turn your Wi-Fi off. And mm -hmm. does your, does your um, application still survive mm -hmm. even though it's not got any internet connection? Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's something that still astounds me. I mean, I mentioned this before that, mm -hmm. that Outlook still struggles if you lose your internet connection. Yeah. And that's been the case since the 90s. Which I find that's fascinating. <laughs> Exactly. So, so just reading through these different types of testing and, and why you do the testing actually brings out new perspectives, uh, perspe perspectives on what you should be testing, what you should be looking at. Uh, and this helps you talk to the developers as well and the engineers around. Uh, so the users are going through this process and this happens, what should happen? And there are things that should happen from a design perspective, but of course also from a developer and an engineering perspective, which puts you uh, around uh, discussing the same types of problems, which, which is really neat. Mm. And I, I, was, I was actually blown away kind of, because I've worked in this industry for many years, and I was blown away by the fact that I haven't been involved as a UXer to the extent that I perhaps would like to in these th different types of tests. And, and, and this is an important mm -hmm. point, Per, because mm -hmm. all of these different tests mm -hmm. ultimately impact mm -hmm. the user experience. Exactly. I mean, if you don't, yeah. if, you, if you have a, a web app or, or a website that um, say has a memory leak, I mean, that might, mm -hmm. that slows down the website, it might crash. If the website mm -hmm. crashes, then it, it, that's not good for users. Mm -hmm. um, the, the same thing with the interruption testing, like you said, if it mm -hmm. doesn't work to lose your connection, um, mm -hmm. or when you get a phone call, severely impacts mm. the user experience. Um, mm. If the button isn't clickable, yeah, clearly, mm. that's not good stuff. Um, yeah. it's, you know, so we need to be more um, aware of and maybe engaged with some of these yeah. aspects so we can consider them and make maybe better decisions earlier on to help alleviate exactly. problems. Something I think you and I talk a lot about is performance testing, because uh, we are aware of how long things can take depending on how they're built. Um, so that's a discussion you definitely should be having with your developers. Uh, do, do they have any ideas and thoughts and knowledge and experience with designing things in different ways and how that impacts how slowly or fast the, the app or the website actually performs? Uh, and knowing and realizing that you have to test that on devices for it to actually be real.
and also how maybe some of these things mm. combine and overlap. Mm. Like if you start having a, if you've introduced maybe large images into your design, and mm. you've had a dialogue with the developers about how to best implement maybe lazy loading or or yeah. kind of um, reduce the the footprint of these images, um, you've then got to go on to test to make mm. sure that that solution to alleviate your design decision um, or minimize the impact of it is robust. Exactly. And it goes on to talk about installation testing as well. And that also made me realize uh, the install, uninstall workflow and how seldom we actually engage in, in looking at that, the uninstall workflow for an app. How, how involved are you in doing that as a UXer? Or is that something that just somebody takes off in a box? Mm. So in the end, I, I'm actually, I'm, I, was, I, was this, I found this article extremely useful. Uh, it goes on to talk about, of course, how important it is uh, to test design with prototyping and wireframing. And it also mentions, which I want, also want to mention, uh, the code testing, which in this uh, article it explains as you do it either with simulators that you can do online to test your website in different browsers online, uh, but you actually ha also have to do it with actual devices to be certain. And what really got me going, uh, this was on Friday, was the, this realization of how difficult it is to understand what something looks like on mobile devices these days, because many of us are still stuck in the idea of a pixel being a pixel on a screen, whereas these days, many of our screens are so have such high pixel densities, that they have such high resolutions that there are many pixels per pixel. I don't know how to explain this <laughs> on a podcast. <laughs> Well, well, I suppose basically, <laughs> with on a screen, you've got ultimately you've got an LED nowadays. You've got an LED lamp um, in millions of places <laughs> in your screen. They're yeah. very, very tiny, and they shine different, you know, three different colours: red, green, or blue. Mm. And that pixel is no mm. longer what we work with as far as a CSS pixel because mm. of the density. There's too many LED pixels now on your screen, mm. so so one one pixel might actually be four. Exactly. In reality, on the screen, the physical and screen. And then you realize when you're going from phone to phone, uh, one, one screen may actually have three of those pixels per inch, uh, 300 per, per inch or whatever, and others have 600 per inch. And then it's, you realize, well, if, I, if it only went by pixel, then it would be half the size on the bigger screen. Uh, the challenge then, of course, is that somebody had to decide, well, it has to be the same size still. And there's actually a rule that you can keep in your head uh, that 96 pixels, a, a div that is 96 pixels wide is an American inch wide on the screen. <laughs> roughly. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's pretty roughly. much impossible to hold consistently it, it across every single screen and yeah. device, but that's the, that's the mm. standard that it's tried. Mm. We've tried it's to trying. implement. Yeah, we're trying to Which follow. means that you also have leakage over half pixels and single pixels, which means it's really difficult, of course, as a developer th these days, to always get the right look on different screens. Mm. I mean, the, the, the article, mm. I mean, it, mm. it does mention mm. browser testing, but I mean, that is complex with all the different browsers, um, mm. especially when you consider the number of devices people use and browsers across devices. Um, yeah. Yes, maybe Chromium dominates just now, um, but, well, in both Android and desktops, um, but that's not necessarily the case with um, Apple devices. Um, but on top of this, um, and this is what we're getting into with Pixels now, is the responsive testing. Yeah. That you may have tested in all these different browsers, but what what size viewport did you test in those browsers? Mm. That <laughs> makes a huge impact on you know what what the person sees, mm. and this is something I've I've um, talked about. Oh, I encourage when it comes to analytics mm -hmm. um, that I, I think, because normally we design to breakpoints. Yeah. Well, yes, things are fluid between them, but you, you generally would have an idea about how something will look at that width, that width, that width, or that height, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, so I try and encourage um, the sending in of breakpoints as something to the analytics um, software, so Google Analytics, for example. So you can actually um, divide your data up and look, okay, how, how did people maybe experience it at that width or this width? Uh, mm. Because the experience can be very vastly different if you're looking at the mobile breakpoint compared to desktop breakpoint or somewhere exactly. in between. Mm. I mean, I'm reminded of when we in the, I mean, the late 90s, early 2000s, we were designing for different screen sizes on monitors and we, we were complaining about how how difficult it was to choose the right screen size. But... 
today you have thousands of different types of phones because a lot of people are stuck with the phones they had five years ago and some are upgrading all the time and it's just it's almost impossible to keep up it's a, it's impossible to have a testing area where you have all these devices to be able to test so of course you're sort of dependent on these virtual testers test possibilities online but you also have to be aware that you perhaps need to be able to listen and make sure that people can report back different types of bugs based on the viewport size yeah uh, and also you've got the as accessibility aspect too that you you might be using a larger font in your telephone mm. or or screen settings set to be bigger or smaller than Default. Exactly. Um, so this adds this adds you know, yeah. two or three permutations to all the other permutations mm. you've already gathered mm. when you're mm. testing. So it becomes mm. it actually becomes quite difficult to even get your head around how many different things. This is complicated stuff we work with. Mm. But it can actually be fun to talk about. And I think having that discussion with your developer developer team is actually fun. You can make it a fun thing uh, to talk about the complexity, talk about how impossible it is to do the right thing, and what you can do together to make it uh, as seamless as possible in your work process as day to day. Mm. And, and, make, and make things mm. robust, but you know, as in they can cope with failing because yeah. we can't, we're not gonna be able to get exactly. this to work yes. on all devices and mm. all screens. Mm. So we just need to make sure that when, when things do break, they break mm. in a way which actually is you know, something you can deal with. So yeah, article number two today, um, delivering a good experience as a developer. So this article basically covers UX and DX plus internal developer experience and how they're intertwined. So you're probably asking straight away, what's DX? Um, but he starts off by trying to define both UX and DX. Now, I'm, I'm not going to critique Pierre's yeah. definition of UX because we, we, we know how difficult it is to, to define, do that ultimate definition of UX. And he himself actually says, UX is really hard to explain. <laughs> yes. And he's completely right. So we'll, we'll, we'll park that there and we'll, we'll look into his UX definition. Um, but um, he, it's the developer experience side of this that ignited my interest in the article. Now, Pierre says that Developer experience, DX, is quite a new term in the industry. Um, it's actually been around for about a decade, um, I think. But it seems to have gained a lot of traction in the last few years. Hmm. Um, I don't know why. I mean, I don't know if there's... I, 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 I have to admit, when you mentioned it to me, I wasn't really aware of it. I, I may have heard it at one point or another. I didn't realize people were talking about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'd say I think it's the last couple of years and I've... I've I've seen it be mentioned in articles a bit more and being brought up mm. um, even by developers. I think the, mm. I would say maybe the younger developers that I'm working with, they actually do talk about developer experience um, quite casually now. Mm. Um, so it's, it's definitely gained traction. Well, what is it? Well, um, it's the overall experience lived by developers, PSS, um, you know, as they basically develop code. Um, as well as the UX of specific services where developers are the target audience. Mm. So here, Pierre gives, the, uh, gives two examples of S Stripe and MailChimp. So the payment handling service Stripe, he says, puts the developer experience to the forefront. It doesn't try and hide dev information away because it's, it's made for developers. Yeah. MailChimp, on the other hand, they hide their dev stuff away. I think it's on a it's on a subdomain, um, and it kind of makes sense because Mailchimp isn't made for developers, not as the primary audience. And if there was too much, if the developer experience was too strong when you approached Mailchimp, then that probably would scare away their primary audience. Yeah. Now the third thing he talks about. It actually makes me think that when you're sort of a hybrid person like you and I are. Uh, I sometimes struggle to find the developer information because I want it. I want the <laughs> the API codes and stuff, but it's sometimes hard to find for me. Yeah, I mean, we maybe have a different checklist that we mm. we maybe look at different aspects quicker maybe yeah. than the primary audience. But anyway, the the other um, thing he talks about, um, which I think is this is really really interesting, is the internal developer experience. So Pierre uses this phrase to describe. Um, how it is to, to work in a project as being a developer. 
So, for example, how code is organized, how it's structured, how you, how you comment and document um, the code. So creating better, a better experience um, for other developers maybe who will work with this or even, even yourself in the future. Um, so this is not this is not just using tools services that are designed for developers. This is your experience as doing the whole job at the organization as a developer. And I thought this this was just really interesting to think about, um, reflect on how few UXers I know or heard of that have worked with this. Do you know what I mean here now? That well, work, worked with well, uh, thinking about the developer experience. Yeah, because I mean, if you think mm. about it, we're, we're constantly developing all these websites, mm. websites, mm. apps, and services, and so on. Mm. And and sure, we've got things like Storybook and design systems and, and mm. what have you. But um, when it comes to the actual understanding and research around um, the developer's life as, as, a, mm. as a developer, um, we, we don't spend much time using our UX skills to help them. Reflecting on projects, it's normally like the developing team themselves that say, mm. oh, we need to document in this way, or we need to code our structure, we need to structure our code in this way and that way. Yeah. They themselves um, come up with the insights and the response to what they've realized to try and make things better. Um, mm. You know, think about the way we're working agile and you know what needs to be improved next sprint, how can we kind of work better? Um, this is generally reflecting within the development team rather than using some of the skills, using more of the skills that we have to under yeah, understand see. the experience, yeah. consider how it can be improved, mm. helping implement those improvements and evaluating them. Mm. It, they are, um, mm. I think when we were discussing which articles to, to talk about, I, you've said about how developer experience, well, you know, it's just user experience because developers are a user. Yeah. And you, you're completely right. We could have we could have anything X. Mm. Um, we do have a fair few something mm. X's already, mm. but in this just this instance, it struck me that we don't help out maybe as much as we should. Yeah, there was actually one piece of the article that uh, jumped out at me, which I realized here's here's some a place where we could help a lot. Uh, when he's talking about documentation. Uh, he's talking about how the documentation needs to be happen all the time and it has to be ready at any time. Uh, but he also has the phrase, don't over-document. Mm -hmm. Now here, that's the real struggle, isn't it? That you need to document, but you can't spend too much time on it either. Uh, I see the same thing in healthcare when you're actually working uh, documenting your meetings with patients. You can't document too much because then the next person in, uh, who's taking over won't have time to go through it and it will be too difficult. But you have to get just enough yes. for it to actually uh, to make sense so that people can take over. Yeah, you see, <coughs> and this is exactly where our, <coughs> where our <coughs> skills as UXers would come in because <coughs> you'd, yes. you'd do the research, you'd understand yeah. that developers need <coughs> some kind of documentation. <coughs> and then you'd, then you'd look at the kind of documentation they have. You'd then maybe <coughs> uh, analyze you know, <coughs> what happens with that documentation. Oh, right, no, oh, well, I don't read it because it's too long. <coughs> Ah, okay. So then you'd maybe help them structure documentation or yeah, give them advice on how maybe they could document mm. um, so that it would be more useful mm. to those target mm. audiences, which is mm. their future selves or other developers if you're handing mm. over to them. And you also need to be thinking in layers. Why are you doing this? It's to help the developers. And why are you helping the developers? Well, because then you create a better quality product. Uh, what is a better quality product? Well, that is what we talked about just earlier. It talks about performance issues and stuff like that. That is actually affected by being able to produce a really good code, which is affected by how well it's documented. Yeah. And also, you're helping mm. um, for like knowledge transfer. Um, just one, potentially mm. one short comment um, above a function in a mm. clump of code um, mm. might mean that another developer spots that when they're going to copy it to you somewhere else and realize, oh, right, they did that because of that. Mm. And maybe then it, it enlightens them into a reason behind something that possibly they would have just brushed aside or mm. not, not even had any idea about otherwise. Exactly. And I, I, for me, it's the same. I mean, we have the same problems and issues within UX in, in documenting designs and the reasons behind decisions. 
So again, we have a lot of experience in understanding that problem and experience in understanding how much should we document for it to be useful. Yeah. So again, I mean, this, this is a great example of where we should uh, partner more also in the way we work together. Yeah, because ultimately, ultimately this impacts on a user. Yeah, and that's yeah. what we care about. Mm. Um, and I think also this impacts back on us because mm. the, the developer teams we work with, just like us, they've got a finite amount of time. So if they have a better experience while they're working, mm. then their work is probably going to be more mm. efficient, mm. which then frees up more time to do more things. So we, we have a kind of win-win here. If we can help the developers with mm. the experience that they're having, then they can help us deliver a better experience further down the line. Exactly. And I, I kind of like when we talk about these these technical issues in this way, because there is this ongoing discussions always that pops up now and then, not so, so much lately, but should designers be able to code? And I don't want to get into that, I w but I want to um, say that maybe the question should be, as designers, how well should we understand the material we are designing with? So if you're working as a designer in clay, <laughs> you, you you kind of know that you can't just take any piece of clay and mold it into anything. Uh, there are probably hundreds of different clay types, I'm assuming now, I have no idea, <laughs> that you can work with. But if you're a painter, there's a, there's different paint. There's, I mean, there's, depending on what you want to accomplish, you make different choices with your material. And it's the same thing here. The more we understand about our material and the different aspects of it and how it, we can mold it differently and create different performances, mm. that is important. Yeah. And it helps us. And we can't keep track of everything. And I think that was an important we made just earlier as well. We can't keep track of everything. We just need to understand this complexity. And the better we are, are at understanding it, the better we can create fallback solutions as yeah. well. And you, mm. we, wouldn't, mm. we wouldn't try making um, a product for a healthcare professional without trying to understand the healthcare professional that was going to use it. Exactly. And we yes. wouldn't, we shouldn't and wouldn't try making a developer experience without understanding the developers. But this doesn't mean to say we have to be doctors and, and nurses and so on just to be able to make a healthcare um, app as a UXer. Hmm. So we don't have to be developers to actually understand the experience the developers are having. Yes. And we've, I mean, we, we've talked before about... Um, how you know communicating or articulating design design decisions design decisions which is a book my, my tom grieve we talked about and that mm -hmm. whole thing about how our job often is just facilitating or communicating to um another person and sometimes that person is a stakeholder sometimes it's um a developer a team member exactly and developer experience is mm. just um an aspect of that mm. um of of making that communication and mm. understanding better mm. for, for between us and them, but also for them to do the work. Mm. And remembering that empathy applies not to only to the end users, but to everyone on our team, every stakeholder, because the better we can help everyone work together, the better the product will be in the end. Mm. I wonder if it would be a good idea to like, next time one of your team says they're going to refactor some code, offer to sit with them. Yeah. And you know, just just look and see how their their world is, and and maybe you can even give them some tips and advice straight away. I like that. We have some uh, recommended listening for you, I think. Yeah, seven years ago, we looked into the question: What screen size should you design for? <laughs> <laughs> No. Did we answer that question? Yeah, I think we, we well we uh, we had a I think we came with quite a good suggested process for how you oh, go yeah. about deciding that. And looking back, is it st is it still valid? Well, this is the thing that you know we talk, I think we called that episode um, James and Per move beyond nine sixty, um, and a nine sixty in some ways seems quite a small resolution mm. screen width um, these days. But the process that we suggested that still copes with it. That still works, I think. Interesting. Wow. So episode 52 <laughs> is our recommended listening um, and reading because there's a transcript to that one. Thank you for listening. Always a pleasure. Uh, a quick reminder, you can contribute to funding UX Podcast by visiting uxpodcast.com slash support. And you can also contribute with your time. So don't forget to volunteer to help us with our transcripts 
and bits and bobs of our publishing routines. Remember to keep moving. See you on the other side. Why did the web developer send a few extra bucks to his hosting provider? I don't know, but why did the, uh, they send a few extra bucks to their web hosting? Oh, what did you say? Provider, yeah. <laughs> Not doing very well. Because she heard that she should always tip her server. Oh. <sighs>